Greetings. This is the commentary and sermonette on the song. Open up and listen. April 27th, 1983 is the date that I have on this, so this was probably done in one sitting. Even though that's true, sometimes the songs evolved a little bit over the years. And when I decided to record this some, what, 35 years later, I changed the order of the verses around a bit. I'll explain why in just a moment. I've been asking the Lord to help me to know which songs to upload next and to complete, not knowing how long I'll be able to keep my health, if I can get all of them done or just a certain number. So I felt a strong impression for this one. I don't really remember the reason why. But one of my first thoughts was it felt like it's a little bit of a juvenile song. And then when I started working with it, I decided I really did like it. There's a lot of substance to it. So even though I'd only been a Christian about, uh, let's see, six years at that point, in fact, almost exactly six years, I was very happy to do this one, and I had a lot of fun with it. So I want to get right straight into the lyrics. This whole song is an appeal, obviously, to open up and listen. God's got so much He wants to share with you. But if you won't open up and listen, tell me, how's He supposed to get through? After all, You've listened to a million other voices. Have you ever even found one that's true? The Bible, my friend, is a treasure chest of jewels for you. But you gotta open up and listen. Open up and listen to him, my friend. Open up and listen. He comes speaking in wisdom. Open up and listen. No one even holds a candle to him. Open up. Well, I'll just tell you, that's either all true or it's not. Forty plus years now, since I decided to open up and listen, I can't get enough. I cannot get enough. If anybody told me that this book, one book, could captivate me for an entire lifetime, and even at the end of that lifetime saying I've just scratched the surface, I'd say, there's no way. And the New Testament is really only not even this many pages, not even this many pages of a book. And yet I have not even begun, not even begun to get out of here what is here, much less the Old Testament. So it is indeed a treasure chest of jewels, but there's no way that I can convince you of that. I can just tell you that. And then I'll let God himself convince you of that if you indeed open up and listen. I mean, you've listened to a million other voices. Why not this one? But, you know, I hear complaints about preachers. Suits and Cadillacs, all brand new. Don't you know anything men are into? There are frauds. Many, not just a few. But if they're using God for money, don't you know they're gonna lose? Oh, the judgments he has waiting for them will make your hair stand on end. Open up and listen. The Lord Jesus is a coming. Open up and listen. Any games, he's not a playing. Open up and listen. Oh, I just don't want you to miss him. Of course, the truth is nobody's going to miss him. Uh, I did a sermon one time. It's actually in a Catholic church of all places. It's with the Minister Association on Good Friday. Good Friday for whom? That's the title. Well, for those who are Christians like myself, Good Friday. It's a real good Friday. It's a really, really good Friday. For those who do not become Christians, this is a bad Friday. A really, really bad Friday. Then when I referred to Jesus, I said, this Friday was a mixed bag. Till 3 p.m. is a bad Friday. A really bad Friday. A really, really bad Friday. The trials, the beatings on the cross. But then after 3 p.m. it became a good Friday. A really good Friday. Well, going back to the group that never become Christians about being Bad Friday, I use the illustration that when I was in South Florida, I went out on the ocean a couple times, and for all I know, I may have gone over sunken treasure, a ship that went down and just treasure chest of gold down there. But I never knew it, so what you don't know sometimes doesn't hurt you. But in this case, to miss this treasure chest, to sail over this, to miss him, at the judgment, you will find out you missed the treasure of all treasures, the Prince Pearl. So if you miss this, you're going to find out that you missed it.
I might have gone over sunken treasure for all I know in South Florida. All I could do is think about getting back on solid land because, oh man, I got seasick both times. One of the things that floored me when I first got into this Bible was what it teaches about false teachers, false preachers, false Christians. I had no idea. We always talk about hypocrites. Well, listen to this. But false prophets arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. So even the ones that aren't saved that are going to be destroyed, they have been bought. Quite honestly, God has uh, creation rights to all of us. Then he has uh, blood purchased rights in that all judgment has been given to the Son, whether saved or unsaved. So it's like Christ's obedience, God the Father said, you're just going to be the judge of everybody. So he's bought everyone, whether they acknowledge that or not, even though creation rights were all his anyway. But these people are doing this stuff, this false teaching, many will follow their sensuality. That's the key right there, sensuality. And because of them, the way of the truth will be maligned or be slandered or, or spoken evil of. Because it'll be like, see these people, man, they say they're this and that and the other. They're, they're not anything like that. But these individuals that are leading this, I love this, in, in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. I like the King James says, in their greed, they will make merchandise of you. You become resource for them. It's not always just money, but a lot of times it's just money but other resource where they use you to build their little thief thugs. Their judgment from long ago is not idle and their destruction is not asleep. And then he goes on talking about Sodom and Gomorrah. But here's another few things he says about them. He says that he knows how to keep the unrighteous under punishment until for the day of judgment. I think that might even be talking about Hades. There are people that exit this life, they'd be in Hades. So they're under punishment, but they're being reserved for the day of judgment. That's the great and terrible day of the Lord when everybody's going to appear before him and their bodies will be resurrected and put together with their spirit, whether for punishment or for going into glory. He knows how to keep them under punishment for the day of judgment, especially those who indulge the flesh in its corrupt desires and they despise authority. Well, that's one thing you'll find out false teacher and preacher. They're lone rangers out there, man, and they're the chief of their little kingdoms. They're daring, self-willed. They do not tremble when they revile angelic majesties. Whereas angels who are greater in power, they don't bring railing accusations against them before the Lord. So they'll curse Satan and all this kind of stuff. You need to get away from these people. Jude talks about the same thing in the book of Jude. But these, like unreasoning animals, they're born as creatures of instinct to be captured and killed. They revile where they have no knowledge and they will, in the destruction of those creatures, also be destroyed. Suffering wrong is the wages of doing wrong. They count it a pleasure to revel in the daytime, their stains and blemishes. And they carouse at the youth, having eyes full of adultery. They're looking at the women, man, that never cease from sin, enticing unstable souls. They take advantage of people that are unstable and weak and vulnerable. Having a heart trained in greed, probably the word there for uh, gymnastics so they've practiced in it accursed children forsaking the right way they've gone astray having followed the way of Balaam it goes on to talk a little more they are springs without water so it's a promised spring of water but there isn't any water there mist driven by the storm for whom the black darkness has been reserved for speaking out arrogant words of vanity they entice by fleshly desires by sensualities, those who barely escape, the ones who live in error, promising them freedom while they themselves are slaves of corruption. And then listen to this in Jude. One thing that these false teachers will do is they turn the grace of our God into licentiousness. In other words, you can go ahead and sin as much as you want and God will forgive you. It's usually not that blatant. But there's so much grace and grace and grace, it's like you can be excused, excused, excused and not ever have to live up to God's standards in any manner, in any consistent form. To where it's always, you'll be pardoned, 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 so people will go for no-fault divorce and all kinds of things thinking God is going to pardon and forgive 
and it's presumptuous sin, and that is a great sin. Keep me from presumptuous sin, and I will be acquitted of great transgression. I could talk a lot about that, but i got to get through this. These men are those who are hidden reefs in your love feasts when they feast with you without fear, caring for themselves, clouds without water, carried along by winds, autumn trees without fruit, doubly dead uprooted, wild waves of the sea, casting up their own shame like foam, wandering stars, we get the word planet from that, for whom the black darkness has been reserved. It says they're grumblers, they're finding fault, following after their own lust, speak arrogantly, flattering people for the sake of gaining an advantage. I couldn't believe it. These false teachers, these false religious people doing all of this behavior. And I even knew that's what they were. And I started to read this, and you see that nothing is for them but judgment, the most severe of judgments. And we're warned about them and warned to stay away from them and definitely warned not to be one of them. So don't worry about these preachers. I say suits and Cadillacs brand new. You know what I mean. That's just illustration. Then I go into the big chorus part. I had a lot of fun doing those harmonies. It's just to give ideas. But then I come into school. Because in 1983, when I wrote this, the Bible is no longer considered in our schools. The reason I threw that little phrase in there, that in 1983, is because I have a son-in-law. He's pastoring a church near Sarasota, Florida. It's called Lakewood Ranch. And they've got these child evangelism fellowship or Bible clubs that are going into the public schools now. And it was because of a court decision where they cannot be discriminated against or something like that. So the point is, the Bible is now being able to get into our public schools. So keep pressing, brothers and sisters. This isn't over yet. And we need to just keep fighting, fighting for righteousness and standing and seeing what doors the Lord will open up and pray for doors to open up. But at this time, the Bible is no longer considered in our schools. Yet, for the skills of living, this book alone has the tools. There's no one yet that's ever found a word untrue, and they never will. God's got a word for those who reject, hearing his news. What does he call them? Fools. Open up and listen. His knowledge won't lead you to a dead end. Golly, what a massive understatement. Open up and listen. A noble mind will ask him questions. Open up and listen. He turns darkness into wisdom. Open up. Skills of living. If you haven't read the Proverbs in a while, just open it up. What I love about the book of Proverbs, 31 chapters. Well, a lot of months have 31 days. So you can read the chapter for the day. Today is the 28th. I think I'll go home and read Proverbs chapter 28. The Psalms is another of the wisdom books, as well as Job, and in New Testament, the book of James. The skills of living. Of course, it's scattered all through the Bible. There's wisdom everywhere. Through it. But those books are known as wisdom books. Teaching us about God, teaching us about man, teaching us about sin, teaching us about the end of things where we're long recited and not short sighted. And when I say not a single word untrue, I'm convinced that in the original writings, which we do not have, there's no extant, E-X-T-A-N-T, extant writings of the Old or the New Testament. What we have is copies, because those would just wear out. Well, in like in the New Testament, probably in the Old as well, uh, they had different schools, different groups that would take on the task of making copies of what they had. And some were much more meticulous to be sure that they did exactly what their one that's wearing out said and not add anything. Well, they know as they've compared these various schools, which ones were more strict or a little more rigid, and which ones would take a little liberty. Conflation is one thing. They would try to smooth some passages out to make them agree with others, to where it wouldn't appear contradictory, or they would add little phrases sometimes. And quite honestly, they also made some mistakes. Like for example, the Greek New Testament, there were no spaces between words. It was just letter after letter after letter and no punctuation. So they're just written straight across like that. So all of the punctuation we have added, spaces between words we have added, chapters we have added, sometimes that's been correct, sometimes it's been incorrect. But the 
point is we're translating from one language to another. We're also translating from copies, some which are more reliable than others. And they call it lower criticism where they are comparing these different copies from different groups to see what may be the original rendering as best as they can tell. It's a great study to be involved in. It's a lot of fun. And in reality, what it does, it confirms for you the strength of the, the scripture as far as how solid that it is. So my point is, is that sometimes there may be some errors from what the original was. I'm convinced whenever Paul wrote what he wrote, or if Moses wrote some of that Old Testament, or whoever was writing, when it was fresh ink and right there, no flaws at all. None of it contradicts itself anywhere. These are statements of faith that I've become persuaded of. The other thing that happens though is when you're trying to translate from one language to another, it's a science but it's also an art. So we're trying to convey thoughts and concepts and we're reaching for the kind of words that will do that. And there have been blunders in that, whether it's in the actual vocabulary or the syntax and sentence structure where errors have been made. And many times, I think the prejudices of people, translators, have entered in which have caused problems. And I could use a lot of examples, like one is, well, i, I got to keep moving here. But I'm convinced that there's not a single word untrue. And the other problem is, Peter did talk about things that Paul wrote and some things that are hard to understand. It doesn't mean that Peter couldn't understand them, but it's hard to understand. You've got to have the basics and then you build properly on the basics if you're going to be able to understand what he's actually saying. So I'm convinced none of it's untrue at all. I'm positive of that. And basically what you have then is two groups. Believers and unbelievers. That's what God says, two groups. You can't prove that what he said is not true. You cannot prove he did not create the heavens and the earth of our current reality. You cannot prove he did not do that in six days. Science does not prove that. There's a group of creation scientists I've referred to before that grew up, all of them probably, as evolutionists and they understand the flaws, the assumptions, the circular reasoning in these sciences and it plagued them until they were confronted with God's word and things happened to change their mind. Even your intelligent design people are on that journey, whether they get all the way over, who knows. But see, a noble mind will ask him questions. This is what's very important. In the book of Acts, and the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. They were escaping somewhere. And when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. Now these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica. For they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Many of them therefore believed, along with a number of prominent Greek women and men. The ones in Thessalonica that received Paul's words and believed him were lucky, because it just so happened he was telling them the truth. The ones in Berea they wanted to hear it, and they eagerly received it, but the authority was the scriptures themselves, and they were searching them daily to see if what Paul was saying was correct or not. They didn't care who these guys said they were. It's like, are you getting this right? And then they believed, not because of Paul and Silas, not even because of their testimony, what they would have said happened to them. The word of God, they became convinced Paul and Silas were handling accurately. That is just extremely critical. And that's why I'm even gonna do a message this Saturday night and I'm gonna tell the individuals to trust me on something. And I'm gonna tell them, I'm asking you to do that, but it's not really right for me to ask you to do that. You need to search the scriptures to see if what I'm telling you is correct here. I'm still gonna do it because I know they can trust me because I know I'm gonna be right in what I'm gonna share with them. But anyway, that's that. Now, as I come to the last verse, I switched the second and third verse around from what I originally had. So in other words, I've got the order I want now. But you've been gaining experience as you're going through life's school. So the Bible isn't considered in our schools. Maybe it is now with these backyard Bible clubs or uh, 
Child Evangelism Fellowship, CEF is what that is. So maybe that's all changing. Maybe that'll spread across the entire country. But at this time, it was being shut out when I wrote this song. But I'm saying, you know, there's another school, Life's School. Some call it the School of Hard Knocks. I'm appealing, my friend, that you open his book. He's got so much to share with you. I know I can spend all my energies proclaiming him to men, and I'll never be shamed that he couldn't and I almost want to say wouldn't, but that he couldn't meet the need of any who call on him. That's the key, calling on him. He is the God of all flesh. There is nothing too difficult for him. There is no situation, no experience, no problem that he cannot enter into and work us through it to where we overcome the world. Jesus said, in the world you will have trouble, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And he wants us to become victors. He wants to make us victors with him over this world and anything that it throws at us. I'll never be ashamed he couldn't meet the need of any who call on him. But you got to open it up. You know, have you ever done it? Have you ever really done it? You've had some life past. Get into it. I just started reading the book of Acts again, haven't read it in a while, and it's amazing how it's impacted me this time. So if you had a little life go by, or read the Psalms again, you haven't read them for a while, read them. It's amazing what you're going to find in there that will now apply that didn't apply before, you didn't see it before. Now as I go on saying to open up to him, I switch and I say, Lord Jesus, open up and listen to us. Be mindful that we're dust. Open up and listen. Win us so our heart will trust. Open up and listen. The darkness can so cripple us. Open up and listen to be delivered. Your hand is a must. I think I've got those words right. But my appeal is to the Lord. We need to call on Him, but we need Him to respond to us. And He must. Our appeal is, please, Lord Jesus. Hear us, win us, respond to us. So I'm going to close with that. Appreciate you listening. And like I always say, listen. You will learn. And when you learn, these are the things of life. And you will indeed live. I'll never be shamed that he couldn't meet the need. Dang it, I'd like to get rid of that thing. Hey! listen to him. I can't remember what all I said there. Hold on. Dang, come on. Lord, Trying to get that, trying to get that locust. I may be in a different place now. <laughs>